the air with the markets kind of meh about this new Labor Department report that's beating expectations with more jobs and more money. That sounds good, right? But it may mean a longer wait until we get some relief from rising prices. Plus, we're finding out today that Paul Whelan, one of the Americans wrongfully detained in Russia, is getting to talk with his parents. A huge sigh of relief for his family, but we're hearing from his brother and where this case goes next. And President Biden coming out today to criticize the rapper formerly known as Kanye West for those heinous and disgusting and dangerous anti-Semitic remarks. Ye is now suspended for tweeting a swastika as we're breaking down a new report showing hate speech skyrocketing on Musk's platform. Plus, we're bringing you an NBC News exclusive, the emotional interview with the mother of a Texas man killed by police. What doorbell and body cam video is telling us about that deadly encounter with a lot of unanswered questions about the shooting. And we're live in Qatar as Team USA is getting ready for its winner go home game tomorrow. And they've got big news with their big star back on the field for it. That's coming up a little later on in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie, and tonight we are starting with the markets, how they're reacting to this new better than expected jobs report we just got in. Check it out. The Dow is closing up a little bit. The S&P, the Nasdaq down, recovering from some bigger drops this morning when the report first got out. Here's what it's telling us. 263,000 jobs added in November. That number is more than experts thought it would be. Unemployment is the lowest it's been in something like half a century. You'd think, yay, right? This should be a good thing. Hallie, aren't these good numbers? More people getting jobs, not that many people out of work. Well, here's why investors are worried. Because all of this job growth, right, all this heat in the job market means the Fed may not slow down its interest rate hikes. Because remember, those rate hikes are meant to cool off the economy. The economy is not cooling based on these numbers. The Fed's going to meet again later this month, where they're probably going to raise those rates again. With President Biden earlier on today signing a bill to avoid a rail strike, talking about how this jobs report, the labor deal, he thinks, are signs that the country, the economy, are moving in the right direction. As we go into the holiday season, here's what this all means. The Americans are working. The economy is growing. Wages are rising faster than inflation. And we've avoided a catastrophic rail strike. Brian Chung is joining us now. Okay, Brian, big picture me here, right? How should we be thinking about what feels like kind of a mixed week as it relates to the economy? Bottom line, has anything really significantly changed or can we still expect inflation to be going up? Yeah, Hallie, I think the big question here is, okay, inflation is bad, but are we in a recession? And at least on the jobs front, the answer is really no. Let's rehash the numbers one more time. 263,000 jobs. That's how many were added in November. That's a big front to all the economists that had expected something like 200,000. So this is a very much a big beat. And important to note, the unemployment rate, 3.7%, that was the same as we saw in October. So we're not seeing an uptick in unemployment, and that's a good thing. The problem is that Americans are still, still dealing with high inflation. That's a big challenge for the Federal Reserve, which wants to get inflation down, but preserve what looks like a pretty good labor market. Talk about the hourly wages, the hourly earnings, because they went up by a pretty decent chunk. Does that kind of make sense, considering everybody is paying more for everything? They do. And this is where there's a very interesting kind of double sides of the of the knife here, if you will, because, uh, as you mentioned, wages did go up by 5.1 percent in November compared to November of last year. That's faster than the wage growth we saw in October when it was about 4.7 percent. But what's the big issue here? The fact that prices are 7.7 percent higher now than they were this time last year. So, OK, great that your wages are going up by 5 percent, but you have to having to pay almost 8 percent more for everything. The Fed wants to make both of these numbers come down, but you can't really tell Americans, well, we want you to get paid less. They hope that this goes down slower than this, but you do wonder, is high wages going to be passed on to the consumer if Target is paying their employers more? Are they going to raise right. the prices on everything else to make sure they can get that in balance? Okay, but what about, so we've seen layoffs in tech, Meta, Amazon, Twitter, we've talked a lot about that, but we're seeing education, healthcare, hospitality have a lot of growth. Is that like the post-pandemic bump boom happening? Yeah, a lot of people wondering, wait, why is this number so hot when I was hearing about all these big tech companies laying so many people off? But when you take a look at the breakdown of what we saw, professional and business services, this is where you may have seen some of the tech layoffs. There's also internet services, which is a different bucket, but this really only rose by about 6,000. It's essentially flat over the month. And that shows you that there were compensations in, other, in hiring in other parts of the industry that maybe even washed out the tech layoffs. So it's not impacting the overall picture. And again, if you look at healthcare up about 
45,000, and leisure and hospitality adding 88,000 in the month. These are much bigger sectors compared to tech, so it's not having a big indentation. You wonder why so many people are hiring in bars and restaurants. Maybe it's because of that big Netherlands game tomorrow. A lot of people got to eat and drink, I guess. What game? What do you mean? I don't even know what you're talking about. I, I heard of the game. Huh. There's a soccer, there's soccer, soccer, you so know, kicking the ball soccer? around the ball. Yeah. yeah Brian, I'll be Sean, thank you much. We'll talk about that later on in the show. Appreciate it. But let me bring it back to what's going down in Washington with the January 6th committee meeting today on the verge of some big decisions about their next steps, about their final report, and whether it's going to include criminal referrals for sitting lawmakers, maybe even former President Trump. Gang, we haven't talked about this before because it's, it's unprecedented. If this happens, it would be making history. Why? Well, remember, the former president and Republican members of Congress ignored subpoenas from the committee, but the clock is ticking, which is weeks to go before the end-of-the-month deadline to get this all done. So now your second question, maybe why the end-of-the-month deadline? Well, the new Congress comes in after the new year, and there's not really going to be a committee. Uh, two of the committee's members won't be in Congress anymore. Republicans who didn't like this whole thing to begin with will have control of the House. Let me bring in Ali Raffa now. So, Ali, this meeting was long. Um, I, I know it only ended, you know, just not too long before we came on the air here. And nobody's really chatting about it too much. But talk to us about what we know um, about the potential for criminal referrals. Does the committee seem somewhat aligned on this or not so much? Yeah, Hallie. Well, you and I have learned over the past year, this is a committee that sometimes likes to leave a trail of breadcrumbs about what to possibly expect from them next. And like you said, today was definitely not one of those days. Members very, very tight-lipped when our team asked them about uh, this meeting, these two virtual closed-door meetings that they had today to go over really the last bullets on their to-do list before they stop their work as, uh, as a committee on December 31st. So while we don't know exactly what came out of that meeting. We do know several of the topics they inevitably had to have talked about. Uh, one of those topics inevitably being those criminal referrals because uh, former President Trump and those uh, House, Republican, House Republicans, rather, including the likely next Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy, who ignored those subpoenas for documents, for testimony, the five Republicans being subpoenaed uh, back, in, uh, back over the summer. Uh, and so this is now being left in the hands of that subcommittee created by Benny Thompson, uh, uh, that consists of the four lawyers on this committee. Committee members have said that their case would have to be airtight if they do decide to send these criminal referrals to the Justice Department. And they've also said that that decision would have to be, at least in the case of Trump, a unanimous decision by all committee members, similar to what we saw them do when they decided to subpoena Trump for his testimony and documents at the last committee hearing. Uh, another uh, still outstanding item that they inevitably must have talked about is that final report that Chairman Benny Thompson says is almost ready, almost done. He says it, it will likely be released uh, before Christmas. How exactly they plan to present that report is still up in the air. Remember, they have said that the last hearing we had uh, was likely the last of an investigative nature, but they left the door open for the possibility of possibly having another hearing to present their findings. So we asked members about that again today, and they said they're still mulling that over, Hallie. Ali Rafa, live for us on the Hill. Ali, thank you. NBC News learning today that Paul Whelan, the American who's been detained in Russia for the last four years after being wrongfully convicted of spying, was finally able to call his parents for the first time in weeks. They were getting really concerned. He was supposed to call home. He hadn't. The State Department officials also saying that even though Whelan was transferred to a prison hospital, he told embassy officials he's, quote, feeling well. His brother David talking with our colleague Andrea Mitchell today about those White House Kremlin negotiations to try to bring not just his brother, but WNBA superstar Brittany Griner home. Listen to what he said. Paul Whelan will not be coming home for Christmas. Brittany Griner will not be coming home for Christmas. I think the, the people involved in the, this uh, decision, whoever they are, um, they have ulterior motives, probably personal to themselves, maybe. So I think we still have months and, and maybe, maybe longer for, uh, for us to see a result. Joining me now is Kelly O'Donnell covering all things White House and White House related from the North Lawn. So, Kelly, you know, Paul Whelan had said to his family, and our viewers know this because we've talked about the story a lot on the show, had basically said, hey, if you don't hear from me for a certain period of time, you should start to get worried. They didn't hear from him for more than three days. They started to get worried. Now they have. But I was struck by a statement from the family where they said, yeah, I guess the relief is knowing he's, in their words, being held hostage in a prison camp in Russia. Right. Like it's it's good news relative to the broader situation here. And they use the phrase proof of life, which is yeah. 
uh, limited Grim. in its reassurance, yeah. yes. Uh, this is the kind of thing where you can't imagine in our own lives, if we didn't hear from a loved one for a couple of days, uh, that would certainly be concerning. But this takes it to a whole nother level and raised a lot of international questions about where was Paul Whelan, uh, what had his condition been, had it changed, was there some uh, concern for his well-being, and the fact that now uh, U.S. officials say he was in a hospital facility, and yet they don't have any explanation about was he moved to that because of a medical need, or was this some kind of uh, step to just sort of move him for reasons that are not on the surface known to U.S. officials. Also, that there was a delay in any communication. So is this uh, some part of an antagonistic process? Uh, also, separately, they described a delay in notification about Brittany Griner's move to the penal colony, uh, a delay in that sort of standard, sort of the bureaucracy of nation to nation when you have uh, nationals being held in another country. And what that says to U.S. officials is that some of the basics that they would expect uh, to be upheld, even though there are tensions between the U.S. and Russia clearly over the Ukraine war, that those basic things are not being followed. And these are obviously very high profile cases. These names are known around the world. Uh, there is uh, certainly an ongoing attempt at negotiation from the U.S. side trying to offer a prisoner swap, trying to uh, get these two Americans home. And as the brother of Paul Whelan indicated, there is no expectation that it's going to happen soon. Certainly the course of events in Ukraine may be a part of it. And the U.S. is limited in what they're saying publicly, in part because their visibility into this situation is uh, not what they would like it to be. And they also don't want to antagonize this situation any further. So good news that there has been this contact established, that the family has heard from him. They know that it is him and that he reports himself to be well. But what else is going on here remains a big question. Hallie? Kelly O'Donnell live for us there on the North Lawn. Kel, thank you. Let's take it on to Georgia now, because with early voting ending today, we're getting a bit of a snapshot, a rare poll of where things stand in this runoff. Among registered voters, Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock clearly has a lead over the Republican Herschel Walker. Among likely voters, though, this is closer. It's in the margin of error, so it's going to come down. Will you be shocked to hear it? Get ready for me to blow your absolute minds. Gang, it's going to come down to turnout. I said it. It's true. There is a clear advantage here, though, which is money. Democrats are outspending Republicans two to one in this race, which reports that Walker's campaign needs cash and needs it bad. Now, he's not looking to help from former President Trump, at least not to show up for him here, but he is getting a hand from Governor Brian Kemp, who won his race four weeks ago, in part by winning the votes of people who didn't cast a ballot for Walker, right, ticket skippers, and by keeping the former football star kind of at arm's length. And when our Vaughn Hilliard got a sit down with Governor Kemp, he asked him, how does he plan to get those people, the people who skipped on the ticket out to the polls for Walker? Look who we have here now, Vaughn Hilliard. Um, tell us more about this interview you did with the governor, why it matters in a race that will determine not control of the Senate, but it'll determine how much of a margin or a cushion do Democrats have. Right. And I wanted to sit down with Brian Kemp because it's notable that the Republican candidate for governor, which he was before he beat Democrat Stacey Abrams by eight percentage points in the general election, and the Republican candidate for the U.S. Senator, Herschel Walker, they really campaigned distant from one another as two separate entities here. And that's where it's notable that Brian Kemp, it's not Donald Trump, like in 2020, 2021 runoff, when he came in at the last moment to campaign with David Perdue, Kelly Leffler, focused largely on his own race. Many Republicans blamed him for those runoff uh, losses. And Donald Trump isn't here for the final week of campaigning in Georgia. And instead, it's Brian Kemp who is on the television airwaves, this sort of weird American political figure who uh, was able to roundly beat a Trump-endorsed challenger by more than 50 percentage points in his runoff, and then beat Stacey Abrams by eight percentage points. And that is where you saw in the general election results, Hallie, there were 200,000 folks here in Georgia who voted for Brian Kemp for governor, but didn't vote for Herschel Walker. I wanted to throw that question as to him as to the why and how he can close the gap. Take a listen. The runoff to me, this is a turnout election. You've got to convince a, a good segment of those folks to come out well, it, if and they, turn if, out and vote for Herschel If they come Walker. back and vote. But you also had a lot of people that voted for the Libertarian uh, that nobody's talking about. And if they come out and vote, you know, I'd say probably 70, 80 percent, maybe even close to 90 of those folks would vote for a Republican and vote for Herschel. 
Sally, there's a lot of us just like Governor Kemp and myself, uh, folks on the Democratic side, too, that are playing the guessing game as to, number one, who's going to come out and who are they going to fill in the oval for? You know, in the case of the Libertarians that the governor is mentioning, there are 81,000 of them that voted in the U.S. Senate race in the general election. And the margin between Warnock and uh, Raff and uh, Herschel Walker was just 38,000 votes. So where do those Libertarian voters go if they vote? That's the question mark. Yeah, and that's what you heard the governor speak to there, Vaughn. Let me talk about the other side of the race here, which is Senator Raphael Warnock. Uh, he got a bit of a boost, as we've talked about, star power from former President Obama, who overnight held this rally for him in Georgia. Is that moving the needle at all today among voters that you're talking with? You know, the line out here today has been quite remarkable. Everybody that we talked to remarks how it's more like a Tuesday election day type of a turnout. And you've seen record numbers of voters that are coming out. And the Democrats needed, they wanted to pad their numbers of these early votes. Today is the last day of early voting. That is why Barack Obama was here last night. He, his appearance played across local television airwaves in the local news outlets here. This was a moment for Democrats to send the message to voters here who are not used to voting on uh, the first week of December uh, in an election. They voted on January 5th in the 2021 runoff when they first voted for Ossoff and Raphael Warnock. So that's why they said there's no better person in democratic politics to bring out the megaphone and be able to connect with folks and get them to understand that the time to vote yet again is now. Vaughn Hilliard live for us there in Marietta, Georgia. Good to see you. Thanks, Vaughn. You know who else is campaigning for Senator Warnock? President Biden. So why didn't we talk about that with Vaughn? Because the president's not actually in Georgia. He is in Boston, right? Campaigning from afar, fundraising from afar, telling union workers just in the last hour that usually both candidates could deserve a spot in the Senate, but not this time. Check it out. One doesn't deserve to be in the United States Senate based on his ver veracity and what he said and what he hadn't said. The other man is a really, truly decent, honorable guy. So President Biden from a distance will try to raise some money for Senator Warnock. Mike Memoli is there also in Boston. There's another reason that the president is in Boston. Or let me say this. There's something else that the president did while he was in Boston, and that is see Prince William with the royals making their first visit to the U.S. in eight years. Let me show some video here. We showed it live on my other show earlier on another network. Um, you couldn't really hear much. I know it was windy and loud, and there was, like, noise from overhead. It sounds like they small talked about the weather. I am... I don't know this for a fact, man, but I am almost certain, quite certain, that they did not bring up, that the president did not bring up the scandal over racist <laughs> remarks made by somebody at Buckingham Palace who has now stepped down that has largely overshadowed the royal's visit here. Yeah, that's right. And in fact, Hallie, Karine Jean-Pierre, the White House press secretary, was asked if President Biden had watched the trailer, right? We've all seen it, uh, of the that Megan new documentary Harry. coming yeah. to Netflix about Prince. Yeah, exactly. And as uh, Karine put it, the president's been a little busy, hasn't seen it. And so that just speaks to one of the distractions around Prince William's visit. Now, this meeting between the president and the Prince of Wales happened at the JFK Library. You can see it behind me lit up in green. That's all about the Earthshot Prize, this uh, all drawing attention to climate change and efforts to combat climate change. That's what brought Prince William uh, to Boston and what the focus was supposed to be of his trip. And that's what I was told in a conversation I just had with a British government official was the focus of the conversation that the two men had here uh, a short time ago, that President Biden was really interested in learning more uh, about the Earthshot Prize, that he uh, they spoke in detail about uh, one of the finalists for that prize, something called the Great Bubble Barrier, an effort to clean up some plastic pollution in our waterways. So some substance uh, on an issue that's important to both men, of course, but there was a lot of personal discussion as well. I'm told uh, Prince William thanked President Biden for coming to London just a few months mm. ago uh, for the funeral of Queen Elizabeth II, of course, and that the two men had a chance to share uh, some memories of the queen as well. So Biden always likes to say all politics is personal, even foreign policy. Uh, and that's certainly part of the discussion these two had here. Yeah, definitely on display here, ma'am, as you are channeling your inner Keir Simmons. I wonder how that feels for you. I hear there were some Trying. protesters greeting the president in Boston hope. today. What was there? What was that about? Yeah, so while we were here covering that meeting, there was a significant uh, gathering all about that rail deal that, of course, the ah. president signed into law just before 
coming to Boston, they, there were a number of chants about uh, the fact that this is a union city and they weren't happy with the president uh, for, in their view, turning his back on labor. But we saw a very different scene when the president went to that union hall uh, where he was literally dialing it in for Raphael Warnock, uh, calling from afar some voters down in Georgia. Uh, the head of the IBEW here in Boston was effusively praising President Biden for always having labor's back. So you can see this is a real uh, issue for the president. Uh, it, it's really dis discomforting for him, right? He's tried to cast himself as the most pro-labor president, but there was a reminder here that a lot of those union workers uh, are unhappy with the fact that he imposed a deal upon them that many of their own members had voted against. Mike Memoli, uh, good to see you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Glad you're up there for us. Coming up here on the show, millions of bottles of cleaning products being recalled because of potentially dangerous bacteria. Do you have any of this stuff? We'll talk about it in a sec. Plus, an old Disney ride getting a new makeover. Why Splash Mountain is not long for Disney. Coming up in our five things. Pantone's calling its color of the year for 2023 unconventional. We'll show you the shade in our five things. But first, a lot is going on with Twitter, right? With President Biden today tweeting out Hitler was a demonic figure. The same day Kanye West's account got suspended after he tweeted out a photo of a swastika. With President Biden calling out political leaders who haven't strongly come out against anti-Semitism, saying silence is complicity. You may think, of course, right? That's obvious. Why is a president needing to say this? Here's the backdrop to it, okay? It is... Ye, the rapper formerly known as Kanye, not just what he's tweeting, but also new numbers today that show hate speech on Twitter is way up ever since Elon Musk took over the platform. Researchers from the Center for Countering Digital Hate say slurs against black Americans and gay men both jumped post-Musk. And when it comes to anti-Semitic posts, they were up more than 61% in the weeks after he bought the platform. Now, as for Ye's suspension from Twitter, he is now not allowed to post, at least not at the moment, TBD, but Musk said it had to be done after Ye posted an image that seemed to show a swastika inside a Star of David. Ben Collins is joining us now. Ben, let's start with the whole Ye Musk situation here. Because, like, listen, Kanye West, the form, as he was formerly known, said just disgusting, horrible, dangerous things to the point where even Elon Musk, who has been apparently, as these numbers show, on his platform, allowing more and more people on the far right, QAnon conspiracy theorists onto the platform, had to say, hey, we got to press pause on Ye's disgusting comments on Twitter, anti-Semitic hate on Twitter. Musk talks about free speech a lot, but we're talking about hate speech here. How does this happen? Uh, look, uh, this is what happens when you have no guardrails on a platform. This is what we've all been saying. And, uh, this is what every researcher or academic who has studied this field for a very long time has said. It's exactly where it ends up. And by the way, today, as he removed Kanye from the platform, Platform. He let back on Andrew Anglin, who runs the largest neo-Nazi blog is. in. Yeah. yeah, he runs the largest neo-Nazi blog in the United States called the Daily Stormer. This guy is is on the lam right now. He is uh, uh, he has a federal bench warrant for his arrest uh, because he has been uh, cyberstalking, harassing this one woman in one town in Montana uh, who is against white supremacy. Um, and this guy's back on the platform now. And the difference is uh, Kanye was overt about this. Kanye, uh, you know, said he liked Hitler yesterday on Infowars and all led up to this big dramatic point. Uh, white supremacists who are committed to the project, committed to the electoral project of wooing uh, young people, of getting people slowly radicalized over time, they are not going to be uh, without this. Uh, they're not going to immediately tweet a swastika. They're going to take their time. And that's exactly what Andrew Anglin said today. He's going to play by the rules on Twitter. Um, but he, the first thing he tweeted about was Zionism and, and, uh, Jews today. So look, um, that's where this platform is headed. Um, it's headed a lot closer towards 4chan than it is to, uh, a civilian like Pinterest style internet. Right. And these, and the, the point that you're talking about here and the numbers that we're showing is, is reflective of our new NBC reporting showing Twitter's just opening up the door back to so many of these QAnon accounts, these white nationalists, the people like you're talking about who now feel emboldened at this point, um, is there, and I know you can't get into Elon Musk's head, right? But the question is now, right. advertisers have fled the platform. Uh, people who use it, like humane users who are not racists, right? Like who, who look at this stuff and go, wait a second, this is for wrong, um, are, have huge concerns about this. Despite this sort of discussion on free speech, et cetera, you're seeing a lot of people who are on the right, on the left, denouncing strongly in no uncertain terms what Ye had to say, et cetera. Is there any point where you see Elon Musk reversing course? 
Oh, uh, he kind of already did with the Kanye thing, but it's going to be case by case. He's speed but running also, that this. Wasn't, he didn't kick yeah. Kanye off the platform. That's a, a no, suspension, right? Right, exactly. And, you know, he aligned with him overtly for the last couple of months. You know, there was memes of him together that he was tweeting and welcoming him back to the platform. So, look, there are, there are a bunch of different ways he's already reversed course. But, you know, he's, he's going to learn the hard way that content moderation is an actual academic field that exists right now. Um, it's some of the largest, you know, Ivy League colleges in the country. This is not a right. this is not a thing that you uh, that you can just wing it and expect pretty good results. Um, look, I will say, Hallie, we're, it's it's going to be a different time. Like we're in a different place now than we were a couple of months ago with how content moderation works and how the internet, how information moves. Uh, conspiracy theories will move a lot faster. Hate speech will move a lot faster. And I think people will have to make a determination. Do they want to be in this neighborhood anymore? Do they want to go down this street that has, you know, a bunch of potholes on it? Or do they want to go to another street? Or do they not, not want to take their car anymore? Is, well, like, is there another the street to go yeah. on? Yeah, do you want to even get in your car, right? And if you do, where do you go? Mastodon, for example. Like, some people yeah, might say, there to use go. anyone. There's Hive Social. Like, what, where do, who, who, is there anything out there that can, re that can replace Twitter? There are a bunch of places that are popping up. But uh, none of them have this, like, none of them have the tools, the trending boxes, the, uh, the following tools, what they call discovery tools, ready yet uh, that Twitter has. So if you want to replicate that ability, um, you know, you're going to have to wait for something to come along that's pretty good. But right now you can go to another thing that's similar, but it's not going to be the same thing. So it's not a great time to try to get accurate information on the Internet. Ben Collins, thanks. Uh, glad to have you following all of it for us. Although, you know, the open question still remains. Like, what do you do? Where do you go? Um, ben, appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, not too long ago, in the last couple of hours, Houston police announced they've arrested two people in connection with the death of Takeoff, the rapper. One man was charged with murder, another with illegally carrying a weapon. You'll remember Takeoff was shot and killed last month outside a bowling alley there. He was 28 years old. Number two, the Louisiana man rescued from the Gulf of Mexico last week after falling overboard from a cruise ship and treading water for nearly 20 hours is now talking about what that was like. Look at this video in a brand new interview. Watch. I was dead set on making it out of there, you know. I was never accepting that this is it. This is going to be the end of my life. The Coast Guard somehow eventually found him in the water. He told GMA the last thing he remembers is going to the bathroom after winning an air guitar contest. He thinks his fall knocked him unconscious. He says he came to in the water, no ship in sight, tried to keep a positive attitude and just kept on swimming. Number three, something like 8 million bottles of cleaning products from the laundress are being recalled because they could be contaminated with potentially dangerous bacteria that can be resistant to antibiotics. People who have compromised immune systems could be at risk of serious infection, according to the Consumer Product Safety Commission. The company says it's aware of 11 reports of infection. They say, hey, don't use this stuff anymore. You can get a refund on its website if you have any of it. Number four, one of Disney World's popular rides is going to close late next month. Why? Because Splash Mountain is getting a Princess and the Frog makeover. Here's a new mock-up of what Tiana's Bayou Adventure could look like. A couple years ago, an online petition called for Splash Mountain to be rethemed because its characters were based on a racist 1946 movie. TBD on when Disneyland's ride is going to close for renovations itself. Number five, take a look. What do you think of it? We're about to show you the shade, the dramatic buildup, then you're gonna see it. Viva Magenta, that's it. Pantone's color of the year for 2023. The company's website describes it as brave and an unconventional shade for an unconventional time. Do you love color marketing? I love it, a brave pink. When we come back, a possible big shift today and how Democrats actually pick their nominee for president. And it may not be Iowa and New Hampshire that are so all important anymore. We're going to take you inside the room where it happened with more on the states that may be going first when we get back. To an NBC News exclusive now about at least four Navy sailors at one Virginia facility who have died by suicide in the last couple weeks according to military officials and family members, now with growing concern over a mental health crisis. We know that all four of these sailors worked for the Mid-Atlantic Regional Maintenance Center in Norfolk. This is a facility where, like, ships are worked on. A licensed counselor who works with sailors told us how serious the situation was, saying, in her words, I was inundated, she says, with the amount of hopelessness at that command. She also said not enough's being done, saying we're putting Band-Aids on bullet holes. One sailor told us that 
People struggle with personal issues there, made worse by a lack of mental health resources and being overworked and undervalued by their bosses. Courtney QB is joining us now. And Courtney, you are now seeing calls by at least one member of Congress for an investigation after this reporting. Deeply concerned about a mental health crisis uh, and how to, how to get a handle on it in the military. Talk us through it and what you're hearing from the Pentagon. Yeah, that's right. And that's that's uh, Congressman Seth Moulton has been outspoken about the need for more attention to mental health problems among U.S. service members. So this facility that we're talking about in Norfolk, Virginia, there's about 3000 people who are assigned there. Many of them are there on what's called limited duty. That means that in some cases they have physical limitations or in some cases they have mental mental health limitations that keep them from being on full active duty service. So this is already a, a potentially vulnerable population, but according to a number of people who are familiar with the situation down there, who spoke with our colleague Melissa Chan, one of our reporters at NBC News, uh, the, it, it wasn't just the situation there that the, the, the population was vulnerable to. There was a, at times a toxic leadership style for that some of them encountered. And then in other cases, they either didn't have the mental health counseling or access to facilities that they needed, or they weren't getting it fast enough. So it seems that there may have been a culture of, um, of uh, that was not adequate to address the mental health needs among some of these people. And as you said, Holly, now there have been four people assigned to this relatively small facility who've taken their life by suicide, it seems, in a, in a short period of time. Um, Courtney QB, is there anything else we should know about this? Is there anything else that you feel like is important to share about what the Pentagon is doing? Because this is an issue that I feel like has is, is been talked about for years, right? I mean, you and I have been doing, you've been doing these, you know this, you've covered the Pentagon for more than a decade, Courtney, and it is, you know, it is a crisis. It is. And look, it's, it's a difficult situation that they have to deal with. And I will say there are many, including the Navy leadership, who are trying to prioritize this. But, it's a, but it, and they, they're doing things like providing more mental health counselors, chaplains, psychiatrists, trying to bring ser service members in for almost like stand down days where they deal with these mental health issues. But one of the biggest problems that continues to permeate through many of the commands is that when you have a concern, a mental health concern about yourself, oftentimes your superior is notified of that. And there are a lot of people who don't want their bosses to know that they're having problems and that they need to go and see and they need to seek help. That's one of the issues that I think we're going to hear more and more about from people like Congressman Moulton, who's been very outspoken about that. There are many people who think that that causes a stigma among, among service members. They don't seek help. And then we at times we'll see tragic consequences like maybe playing out at this command in Norfolk right now. Courtney QB, thank you for bringing us this important story. I appreciate it. We have to say, if you or somebody you know is struggling, there is help. There is help. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline number is on your screen. Take a screenshot if you want. 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. The other line is 988. It's running now to politics, where this afternoon are NBC reporters inside the room as the DNC moved to really shake up the way the party holds its primaries and when and where those primaries happen, slotting South Carolina first in that all-important political calendar and kicking Iowa out. So the plan now, look at it on your screen, starts with South Carolina, February 3rd, New Hampshire and Nevada a few days later on the same day. So those are two states at the same time. Then Georgia and Michigan later in the month. Behind the scenes, plenty of drama on this, according to our team in the room. The only two states to vote against this, Iowa and New Hampshire, you will not be shocked to learn. So yes, pushback, some support, some surprises. Congressman Jim Clyburn, for example, the influential South Carolina House member, only found out about this when President Biden called him last night. Why are they doing this? To signal a push for more diversity, racially, geographically, et cetera. Mark Murray joins us now. So Mark, uh, this is for political nerds, but it's also for everybody, okay? So let, let me just preface by saying that, because I get that we're gonna nerd out on this. However, this makes a difference because the early states dictate where do candidates spend money? Where do candidates travel to? Where do, what do candidates pay attention to? What, what issues matter to these people who are running in 2024? Until now, it was like issues in Iowa and New Hampshire. Well, now it's going to look a lot different with these states coming in. Not a done deal yet. The full DNC has to vote, but give us your take. This is a sea change. And as you and I have been covering politics, and actually a long time before us even, always... I'm you, very young. I'm So it's really only been a minute. Same. Yeah. 
uh, Iowa, New Hampshire, then you had Nevada and South Carolina go. This now having South Carolina going first to me is the biggest change. And it really is a surprise to a lot of us because the assumption was always, you know what, Iowa was going to go away on the Democratic yeah. map after the snafu, their inability to count, and a lot of concerns about how unfair a caucus system is versus an actual primary. But the fact that New Hampshire might actually go second and South Carolina first, that's a big difference because Iowa and New Hampshire in some ways always served as winnowing states. You have 20 Democrats or 20 Republicans going in. Well, what are the four or five legitimate candidates? Whereas like South Carolina, the states that go third or fourth get to be more deciding states. That is, who are we choosing? Is it Joe Biden or Bernie right. Sanders as we found in 2020? And so South Carolina is going to have a different role. They're going to be the winners rather than the deciders. To be ways. clear, this is only for the Democrats, right? Not for the Republicans. And if President Biden does decide to run again come 2024, it's semi-irrelevant, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it makes matters less for the winnowing. Some really big caveats. Yeah, Republicans are going to go like that they've, the, the, the current situation, like it's always been. Iowa, New Hampshire, then South Carolina, and then Nevada. And if President Biden runs for re-election and gets no challenge, when we actually are going to descend covering the 2024 races, it's going to be Iowa first, <laughs> right. then New Hampshire. Repo- right. And so, you know, what, what some Democrats in these rooms were actually telling me was, this is really the pave the way for 2028. And that is, get this out of the way oh my now. God. But, Bite but, your tongue. But Hallie, look. We're in 2022, Mark. There's still, Help there, us. there still is a big obstacle on uh, New Hampshire because their state law say, mandates th- that they actually go first. And how does the party get around the legislatures, right? Because the state could still say, hey, I'm going to go rogue. Sorry, DNC. I'm going to I'm going to try to move our, our primaries first anyway. The good news for Democrats when it comes to a place like Michigan is that the Democrats now control the state legislature. Right. Other states like South Carolina would actually, the parties actually run, not the states. And so there's some leeway there. But again, the obstacle is New Hampshire because New Hampshire says, no, by state law, we're supposed to go first, not second. Well, one question is, well, what ends up happening? Some Democrats have actually told me that a state like New Hampshire could get penalized saying, hey, you know, if you campaign in in New Hampshire, you're going to lose debate participation, delegates. That could actually come back to bite Democrats. So there's a lot of drama that we're going to have to be following this year and through 2028. And again, Again, it matters just beyond the beltway. Mark Murray. <laughs> was that too nerdy, everybody? I don't know. I thought that was perfect. But Mark Murray, thank you so Thanks. much. Appreciate you. Coming up, new surveillance video showing a close call at a deli in Pennsylvania. Why the store owners say they're feeling real lucky tonight. Coming up in the local. Conspiracy theorist Alex Jones filing for bankruptcy today with an attorney for the families of Sandy Hook shooting victims calling this another cowardly move by Jones. You'll remember right now he owes something like a billion dollars plus because of all the lies he spread about that horrific Sandy Hook massacre. Court documents from Texas showing Jones is claiming he's worth between a million to ten million dollars and that his debts are well beyond that. Ten times as much, right? A billion to ten billion dollars. No comment yet from his bankruptcy attorney on all of this. Danny Savatos is joining us now. So, Danny, the attorney, you know, this is, a, this is a new move by Jones. It happened just this afternoon. The attorney for the families of these victims, remember, Jones has been convicted um, of spreading lies, right? He was, he's forced to pay them money because he lied and called it a hoax when it obviously wasn't. The attorneys now are saying this isn't going to work. Chapter 11 is supposed to help people who are facing bankruptcy, and they're saying this is not the intention. How does this play out legally? Right. Jones wasn't convicted. He was found liable in civil court. And it's no surprise that he filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. I think everyone saw this coming because those judgments, uh, there are very few, if any, people on earth who could pay some of the, uh, the judgments assessed against Alex Jones. So the fact that he filed for bankruptcy is no surprise. But uh, beware the person who files for bankruptcy. You will be scrutinized. You cannot try tricky games like saying, Oh, well, all of this is part of the bankruptcy estate. Let me just take out some of my jewelry and valuables and other things. You cannot play games with the bankruptcy court or uh, this group of creditors who will be watching him like hawks. So, and first of all, and thank you, you're right. He not found guilty, right, is, is what I meant to say. I'm a, I'm a layman, not a lawyer. That's an important liable, distinction. Yeah, I know. It, it's tricky. It's tricky. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, but... When you talk about the scrutiny here, how intense is it? In other words, like, is this like an 
and again, a layman here, is this like an IRS audit where they're going through everything, they're looking at all your stuff, they're looking at all your transfers, et cetera, et cetera? What is that like? Uh, you're not alone. Bankruptcy is a specialty, and it is a really complex area of the law. You have so many different kinds of bankruptcy. This happens to be Chapter 11. It's reorganization. The mission, supposedly, is that you file, and the idea is that you're going to save your company or even an individual, save your financial situation, but reorganize, figure out who you owe what to, and ideally pay them uh, at least some fraction of what they owe. But the net effect is that it takes a lot of time. It causes a ton of delay, and that will delay justice for these plaintiffs. Danny Savalas, thank you very much for that breakdown. Appreciate it. To an NBC News exclusive now, as our team is hearing from the family of a man shot and killed by police in Austin, who are now releasing videos showing what happened that night about a month ago. The family of 33-year-old Rajan Muna Singha describes the outrage, the pain that they're feeling now. Yesterday was a hard day for me because I heard how he died and I just, I just wanted to hold him. So here's what we know, and I want you to look at however you're streaming this. This is video that you are likely to find disturbing. This is doorbell cam footage where Moon Singha is seen outside his home holding a rifle. He says, are you sure you want this? Shoots. That moment you can see the cops drive up. I don't know if you can tell in this video here. Um, there it is. We're going to play it again. The warning about this is very disturbing, tough to watch. Draw the gun! So in that body cam footage, you hear the officer firing his gun almost immediately after saying, drop the gun. The officers then walk over to Moon Singh on the ground. Then police say they started life-saving measures. The video that was released stops before that. He later died at the hospital. I want to bring in our correspondent, Gabe Gutierrez, who had that exclusive sit-down today with Moon Singh's family, who is obviously in, in grief. Um, they are having a very tough time here. You heard that. You heard the anguish in her voice just a second ago. Uh, yeah, Hallie. Uh, Raj Singh was 33 years old. He was a tech entrepreneur that had a restaurant consulting business in Austin. He co-founded uh, that business, and his family is devastated. Now, there are still uh, many unanswered questions here, uh, but there is an investigation underway, according to the Austin PD. But I did speak with uh, Muntinga's mother and brother, who say that, in their view, this was a case of police shooting first and asking questions later. Uh, they say that their loved one was protecting his home, that he had a rifle because he believed an intruder was inside the home. Let's take a listen to a little bit more from my interview with his mother. I just wanted to hold him and say I love you. Thank you for being this amazing gift that I had. He, he was a gift to all of us and to many. I, I'm just sad I wasn't there, because he didn't, that shouldn't ever happen to him. And again, uh, his family is demanding answers from the Austin PD. They say that uh, initially, uh, another thing, Hallie, uh, we didn't play it right there, but, um, or it was not e immediately evident right there, but the officer did say, drop your gun in that body camera video. The issue is, according to the family, is that he said it, and then before he could get a response, that he then fired his weapon, shooting and killing uh, Munsinga. So the family certainly has a lot of uh, unanswered questions at this point. We did hear back from the attorney uh, for the officer uh, who is now on administrative leave. The attorney says that he followed his training to protect lives, Hallie. I was going to ask about that. What is the response from the police department here? Are they going to continue? Presumably will investigating, obviously, um, because there are a number um, of things that we still don't know at this point. Yeah, and the Austin PD did release a statement here. They, they said that, uh, you know, this was a situation where the officer engaged with uh, the subject and, um, you know, yelled out a command to drop the gun. Again, the family comes back and says, well, you know, th th they didn't wait for him to drop the gun, that they immediately fired uh, much too quickly. Uh, the Austin PD also says that they conducted life-saving measures uh, right after uh, the gunshots. And you do see that as the body camera video plays out. They do go up to him, and uh, he is uh, brought within a few minutes uh, to uh, paramedics come on scene, but he, he passed away. Um, at this point, uh, Hallie, again, the Austin PD says the investigation is ongoing. They declined our interview request. Uh, but that family, um, you know, speaking publicly for the first time, raising a lot of uh, tough questions about 
the procedures here and, you know, why their loved one uh, was uh, shot and killed. We should point out, they say that they believe that there was a uh, crime in the area, that he, he felt that there was an intruder inside that home, that he had every right to have that weapon. Um, but it's just, just so tragic to see this unfold, Howie. Gabe Gutierrez, we appreciate you bringing us that exclusive interview, and we're going to look for more of it tonight on NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, 6.30 Eastern, wherever you watch your local NBC station. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Western Bureau, police in Moscow, Idaho, are now saying that yes, they do believe the killings of four students there was a targeted attack. That's just a few days after they had suggested the opposite. Detectives also say a sixth person may have lived at the house where the murders happened, but that they were not there at the time. Still so many questions now, even weeks after those murders happened. From our Northeast Bureau, new video shows the moment. Look at this. Driver drives right into a deli in PA. One of the store's owners was taking an order, but an elderly woman somehow lost control of her car. The owners say they're feeling really lucky because nobody got seriously hurt. No word yet on any charges via investigators. And from our Midwest Bureau, no classes today from Mayfield High School in Kentucky because its football team is playing in a state championship football game. You remember this town, tornadoes devastated it a year ago, this month. Its mayor says packed stands at games this season help the community try to get back to normal. Still to come here on the show, some good news for U.S. soccer fans. Team USA's star player just got cleared to play tomorrow. So what are the odds against the Netherlands? As we are now in the knockout stage of the World Cup, stay with us. You're on to the knockout round at the World Cup, and I know there's one team you probably care about the most, Team USA, which, good news, going to get its superstar, Christian Pulisic, back on the field tomorrow. Check it out. There he is. Video our team on the ground caught of Pulisic practicing, getting ready to play against the Netherlands tomorrow at 10 o'clock Eastern. He's cleared to play after that uh, rather painful-looking game-winning goal on Tuesday. Send him to the hospital with a pelvic bruise. Ugh. Grant Wall is joining us from Doha. The founder of GrantWall.com covers all things soccer. We're thrilled to have him. Okay, so Grant, you know I'm not a big soccer person, but I hear Pulisic is like a BFD. It's good news, right, that he's going to be back in the game. He scored the only goals for the U.S., but the Dutch, they're very good, right? I mean, they're globally good. Um, what is your sense of how the, like, I know to have a crystal ball. Good news, Pulisic is back. How much of a difference is it going to be? It's huge news for the U.S. Pulisic is the best attacking player for the United States. This is the knockout rounds. You're going to need goals if you want to advance and upset the Netherlands. So there is a bit of a question. How close to 100 percent is Pulisic? But I, I think he's going to start this game. It's the biggest game of his career uh, and all the other U.S. players. And so uh, he wasn't going to miss. I, I felt like even after the game against Iran earlier this week. So uh, huge opportunity for the U.S. They are not the favorite in this game. The Dutch no. are. But I right. think the U.S. has a chance. And if they played well against England, I think they can play well against the Netherlands. The Netherlands are coming out now. The team's coming out saying, no, they're, they're denying reports that they're dealing with flu-like symptoms, like some issue with the team, although a spokesperson does say that a few people feel kind of snotty, saying, because of all the air conditioners, there's always a few snotty people. Listen, it's the season of runny noses here. Um, how much is this a factor? Like, how, how much on the ground there in Qatar are people talking about this matchup and what this means tomorrow? Have you ever noticed how much Europeans complain about air conditioning, like when they come to the United States? Like they're not doing that lie, here. I'm, I'm sharing a house. I'm sharing a house with three Europeans to come come in and turn down the AC from where I or turn up the AC so that it's yeah. warmer in here. Um, it's a funny thing, but like the Dutch have been complaining about the air conditioning in Qatar causing issues. Uh, Greg Berhalter, the U.S. coach, said he actually had some issues with this uh, earlier in the tournament, doesn't now, but said his players do not. Tyler Adams said, look, I feel good. My teammates feel good. good. No concerns about that. And right. that's a good thing because they haven't had much rest. This has been kind of a World Cup of upsets here. We saw Uruguay get knocked out this morning, Germany the day before. Um, what's been most, is, is there been a big surprise to you among all the surprises here? Who do you think still has the best chance of taking this whole thing? 
I mean, in terms of winning the whole thing, I think I picked Argentina before the tournament started. They've been much better since losing their first game. They advanced. Uh, Brazil has looked good. France has looked good. These are the favorites pre-tournament. Uh, the team that I'm really excited about besides the U.S. is Japan. Japan has beaten Spain and Germany, two former world champions, and took first place in their group. And the Japanese play Croatia. That's a game I think they can win and get to the quarterfinals. And, you know, the Japanese are sort of where the U.S. is in the global order of men's uh, soccer. And so it's kind of cool to see teams like the U.S. and Japan doing well outside the traditional power continents of Europe and South America. Grant Wall, always good to see you. Thank you. Have a blast tomorrow. I guess it's just really a few hours your time. Uh, we will be watching. Appreciate it. That does it for us this hour. More for you here on Monday, same time, same place. Have a great and safe weekend. We'll see you right back here in just a bit. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.